Hi, this is Caleb Kane, and you're watching Kane Course with this dude. Today we're going to take a look at conditions in factories within the Industrial Revolution. For sort of a case study, we're specifically going to look at the meatpacking industry, which became a, a very profitable industry, especially in the United States during the mid-1800s, early 1900s. And this excerpt comes from a book called The Jungle, which was written to tell the story of what was going on in there. So if you can follow along uh, as I read, try to picture in your head what this factory might have looked like, as well as what the conditions would be. There would be meat stored in great piles and rooms, and the water from leaky roofs would drip over it, and thousands of rats would race about on it. It was too dark in these storage places to see well, but a man could run his hand over these piles of meat and sweep off handfuls of dried dung of rats. These rats were nuisances, and the packers would be poisoned or put poisoned bread out for them. They would die, and the rats, bread, and meat would go into the hoppers together. This is no fairy story and no joke. The meat would be shoveled into carts, and the man who did the shoveling would not trouble to lift out a rat even if he saw one. There were things that went into sausage in comparison with which a poisoned rat was a tidbit. There was no place for the men to wash their hands before they ate their dinner, and so they made a practice of washing them in the water that was to be ladled in the sausage. There were the butt ends of smoked meat and the scraps of corned beef and all the odds and ends of the wastes of the plants that would be dumped into old barrels in the cellar and left there. Under the system of the rigid economy which the packers enforced, there were some jobs that had only paid to do once in a long time, and among these was the cleaning out of the waste barrels. Every spring they did it, and in the barrels would be dirt and rust and old nails and stale water, and cartload after cartload of it would be taken up and dumped into the hoppers with fresh meat and sent out to the public's breakfast. Woo! Boy, I hope you didn't plan on eating anytime soon, because that is a little bit of a shock. When you read this text for the first time, you're probably shocked and horrified by the picture that Upton Sinclair uh, creates. However, as he says midway through um, his writing, he tries to make it very clear that this is not a fairy story. It's not a joke. It is real. And the realism of this text really speaks out to us, right? Consider the picture that he paints of all of the meat that's stored in these great piles and the fact that it's covered in water. And with that, there are thousands of rats scrambling all about the meat. And obviously rats tend to uh, be kind of wasteful. And with that, you have their excrement on the meat. And even in some cases, the rats would die and they would still be left on top of the meat. And later on, Sinclair says that uh, the cleaning of this room was not something that happened very often. Rather, it only happened in the spring. And so all of this junk and this waste and even dead rats are being plunged into this meat that's probably not in the best condition because it's been sitting out in very damp conditions. Again, imagine the smell. Imagine the sight of what's being put into the meat. And then you realize that all of this is being ground up and sent out for breakfast. It's an astonishing sight. It's a very vivid description. And yet it's something that was very real. So today we want to unpack why is it that conditions in industrial factories were this bad? And why was there not a lot of care to the health and safety of the products that were being sent out? Upton Sinclair's The Jungle not only gives us a very vivid picture of what factory life was like and what the conditions were like, it also gives us greater insight to some of the things going on in the Times. This is one of the first pieces of true investigative journalism, something we're probably very familiar with in our day and age of Twitter and Facebook and social media and the trying to break a scoop to get attention. We call that muckraking. Muckraking is basically journalism where writers are looking for scandal. Okay? Kind of like paparazzi or people in tabloids that are trying to get celebrities caught for different things because that's what sells. We as humans being sinful, we like drama, we like dirt. And when we get more of that and the more crazy and hysterical of a reaction we can get from people, the more we sell. This is a greater reflection of how times have changed. And ever since the construction of the printing press during the Renaissance, writing now allows us to make money. And in this case, there are journalists who are trying to expose different things in the factory system to get a reaction to people. So we kind of have to take what Sinclair is saying with a grain of salt. Maybe he is being 100% truthful. Maybe not. Maybe he's exaggerating a little bit to try to get... Uh, people to buy his writings, but much like many of us exaggerate in social media to try to get views and get likes, it really speaks to us as a foundational human level. 
However, there were many of Sinclair's claims that were true. Take a look at some of these pictures. Here we have uh, the massive cattle herding areas in these meat packing factories in Chicago. We do have photo evidence of some of this. Here you can see the butchers, the ones who are cleaning these animals and preparing all of it. It doesn't look like a very pretty opportunity. And on top of that, we have just the storehouses full of raw meat. Imagine the stench, imagine the conditions and um, the, the way in which these workers had to go about things. And finally, you can see that cleaning floor that Sinclair describes as well. And you can see all the bits and pieces of who knows what on the floor. It doesn't look very clean. And again, we have limited view of this, but everything that we have is telling us that this wasn't a great situation. And it does make sense that after The Jungle was written that Sinclair did get a lot of attention. In fact, he got it from President Teddy Roosevelt, who in 1906 officially established the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, and made standards in our country for how food needs to be processed and packaged and sold so that there is a clean standard of health. It wasn't just the meatpacking industry that had terrible conditions. We can even go back to more of the start of the Industrial Revolution and back to Britain, which we unpacked in our last lesson, and look at the textile industry. Again, fabrics and finished clothing. And conditions in those factories were brutal as well. You can see in this picture, you have children working. And some of that is because child labor was cheap and kids are relatively innocent and gullible. and. Also, these families wanted to get in the working class, so the kids were willing to work. But if you look at the dangerous machinery you can see here, a lot of metal and pointy objects and spots to get your hands caught, the factories would also be covered with garbage on the floors. And in textile factories, there would be a lot of dust, so you could potentially choke on that or get sick. There were a lot of uh, autoimmune diseases that traveled through there. These factories were not safe. They were not clean. They were not healthy in any means. And again, look at these children that are working in this factory. They're, they're changing um, different parts of the machine that involve the thread to stretch out and eventually weave into fabric. And the one kid doesn't even have shoes on. Uh, that right there is very clearly a hazard. And yet through all of this, the factories remained in pretty poor conditions because they're concerned with one thing. We need to continue to produce more goods and to do it faster so that we can make more money. It doesn't matter how we get there, we need to do it. At least that's what these factory owners are continuing to think during this time. Another important industry that's not very safe is the coal mining industry. Again, coal mining allows uh, for railroads to function. It allows for steam engines to function in these factories. So coal was in very high demand, but these are very self-contained areas where they're very claustrophobic and probably very dark and you have the chance of collapse, not to mention with all of the coal dust you could potentially be inhaling that can often destroy the lungs. It's not a safe place to be working. And yet all of that is a necessity for people because this is where the jobs are. Again, we don't need as many farmers as we once did. So now people are rushing to the cities to live there. And the conditions that people are living in are just as bad as the factories. People are starting to live on top of each other. Because we're running out of space like this, we now have to build upwards. So you can see in this picture, tenement housing, early forms of apartment living, which would be very cramped. And large families would be in single bedroom apartments with not a lot of space. And other people would be living in the, the slums or in the alleyways because that's the only place where there was room to live as we're being drawn to the cities for more jobs. And they might even be living in a location kind of like this. All of this is brutal, and yet it's a necessity for these people because that's how survival is. This is the new way of life. This is the new normal. The majority of people are gonna fall into the working class in which they have to work in factories and bear these unbearable conditions in order to make a living and provide the ability to survive for their Let's families. Let's put this more into personal perspective. Let's say hypothetically, I'm living during the Industrial Revolution. This is me. And I'm loving life. I'm excited because I just got a job at this new factory. And life is good because in this factory, I come in and I get to work um, every day. I get to do so for about eight hours and I get paid every hour. This is great. I get paid hourly and I get to bring stuff home to my family every day. So I'm loving life. My job isn't overly difficult. I didn't need a lot of training to do it. In fact, I just sit here on the assembly line and we're actually working in a car factory and different parts of the car come down and basically it just gets stamped with the indicator for my company. And I just got to make sure I got to check each 
of these little pieces of metal that they're right and in good order. But let's say hypothetically one day my uh, job is taking place and it's going down the line and I go to fix one thing, but I don't get my hand out in time. And suddenly my hand is now squashed under the lever and the hammer and there's blood all over the place. And knowing how terrible our medicine was at the time, I'm now an amputee. I can't work as well as I used to. So when I come to my boss and I say, hey, boss, I need time off. I need to heal up. And when I get back, I'm going to be a little bit different. My boss is probably less likely to hire me back because I only have one arm. And there's hundreds of other workers who would be able to do my same job better than me. Because in the end, my boss is concerned about one thing only, and that's money. These guys over here can produce more money than I can over here. And that's really the heart of the Industrial Revolution. The boss doesn't care about me and my severed arm. Rather, he cares about how much money is he going to make in the long run. And hiring somebody else is going to be much easier than hiring me. As factories continue to grow and urbanization takes hold and cities become more what we know of as cities today, it makes sense that there's a reaction from the workers. Yes, the people know that this is what they have to do, but they're not comfortable with it. If you're going to subject people to very difficult circumstances and very crude environments, they have to be properly compensated. So movements begin to allow the workers the rights to fair treatment. Remember, after the Enlightenment, people are very concerned about my rights. I get what's fair for me. And this is the same for workers as well. They want a fair wage. They want fair hours. On top of that, they want to be protected if they get hurt. And they should be paid for insurance and all of those types of things that we take for granted today, which is going to lead to the rise of unions. You can see these individuals here who are basically rioting because their factories have not treated them properly. People will begin to go on strike, refusing to work until their demands are met. And it forces factory owners to make adjustments in order to have the production that they want and the money that they're going to make. It's why in the United States and in so many countries today, we do have standards for how workers need to be treated. They need to be given certain benefits. They need to be protected. They need to be in a safe environment. This is going to take a while to take hold because, again, Owners are concerned about the profit. Are they making money? Is this worthwhile? And as that continues in unions, these workers who would work together become more popular, we will see better circumstances in factories, which is something we'll unpack later on. Now, one of the other responses to all of this is a movement called socialism, something you're probably very familiar, not yet communism, but just socialism. This was a movement where the working class started to try to get more control of the economy since they're the ones who are actually producing everything, right? It's your workers and your farmers who produce that which the country is successful off of. So socialism holds that the people own the means of production. And therefore, they're the ones who are working in the factories. They're the ones who are running the utilities. And in doing so, everything should be made relatively equal because all these people are on the same page. It takes the power away from the factory owners and gives it back to the people, which is a great idea on paper. However, the problem with socialism is that it holds that everyone is good in human nature. And if we're in the right circumstances, we're all going to work together. And that sounds all nice and, and fluffy and sounds great, but we know that humans are inherently sinful and therefore inherently evil. And when it comes down to it, we're probably not going to give up our wealth and the things that we make to give it to everyone. However, this idea sounds really good and it especially sounds great for the individuals who are in the lower class, who are the ones working in the factories. It gives them the sense of entitlement and sense of power. So when individuals like Karl Marx produce information like the Communist Manifesto, which starts to be a little more radical in the sense of socialism, it makes a lot of sense that this would become very popular worldwide. And as communism and socialism begins to take hold, we still see that these new workers and these new working classes are very concerned about their rights and being treated fairly. A lot of that is because of what they're being subjected to. They're not dumb individuals. They know that they're going through 
tough circumstances and in many cases risking their lives for the good of their family. They feel entitled to certain things in exchange for that, much like the social contract that we've discussed before. You give up certain rights to receive the benefits of being part of the state and part of society. The effects of the Industrial Revolution aren't just things that affected people, though. It definitely affected the environment as well. Think again about urbanization and the fact that all of these factories and cities are now releasing more pollution and human waste into the environment than ever before. One case in point is this uh, peppered moth that was indigenous to England. Um, used to look a lot like this. You don't see many of these anymore. Rather, you see a lot of moths that look like this. It's the same species, but the color is different. And many scientists believe that many of these moths now appear like this because they adapted during the Industrial Revolution to blend into all of the smoke that the Industrial Revolution has caused. So when we think about the Industrial Revolution, obviously there's more change in this period of time than maybe we've ever had in world history with technology and feasibility. But again, consider why that is. A lot of that is reflective, again, of human greed and the human desire to be successful. And we need to think more about what the cost of that is, the cost of human life and the cost of conditions and as well as the environment. And consider, is the world better now than it was before. Many of us would say unequivocally yes, because of the technology and the ease at which we can accomplish things. But there is a cost to all of that. And that's something that continues to affect our world today. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.